Hello, folks, and welcome to the TKW Podcast. I'm Matt Spendley, and I'm joined today by Kyle Maggio. What's going on, Matt? Good to be back. Yeah, good to be back, man. We missed you on, uh, what was it, Thursday's episode? Got caught up playing bocce with the fellas. Yeah, I I found out they added another team to the league, and that was the hang-up. There's not many teams, only four of us, but normally it was three in a rotation, and we all got out of there on time, and... Not uh, not this season. Is that intense? Or is um, it a bunch of guys just chilling, smoking cigars, playing some bocce? I, it's it's very much so the latter. <laughs> the my my intro to it was like a like it was like speedball basically. Like we played with these Italians at high school, and they had like a gravel court, which is not a thing. It's not supposed to be a good uh, a gravel court, and those motherfuckers would just like shoot the ball in and out and. Uh, very aggressively, like blast your balls out, and you know, just it's it's a that was a tough place to play. These guys are very laid back. That's how so. bocce should be played, with a level yeah. of intensity hitherto not seen. That's what it has to yes. be. Yeah, it and they they did, but I was not prepared for that. So, <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk Knicks. So, game against the Pelicans on Friday night. Knicks won one hundred six one hundred. Some nice performances from. Some of the guys, it was good to see Tim Hardaway Jr. get back on track. We saw some nice minutes from Noah Vonley. We saw Lance Thomas have another nice game. So what were your initial thoughts from Friday's game against the Pelicans? Yeah, um, I like the back-to-back mostly consistent um, appearances now for Frank Nielakina. Um He played a, a really nice game against the Nets when they were in Brooklyn, and and there wasn't anything that really wowed me that happened in this game for uh, for Nielakina, but just you know seeing him be that same consistent presence that we saw um, you know all last season was something that I, I liked a lot. Like you know, the, it's the preseason; nobody's playing one hundred percent, but Frank's still making all the right rotations, all the right recoveries, um, just just playing stout like that. That to me is important because as long as that's going to be a constant he's always going to get enough playing time it's just a matter of where um so i like that his did again despite not really being in the stat sheet he looked a little bit more comfortable so that was fun um von Ley has just very much impressed me with his energy i'm interested i'm yeah i'm interested in noah von Ley. yeah I, I, that's that's where i'm at because i don't know where this ends up but he he just very clearly looked like a, a top two or three impactful player in each one of these games that they've played so far. On a permanent just, basis, for sure. Yeah, yeah and uh, so, I mean, that's been good. That's been good. I, I, I don't know where I see him on this team, if he does, in fact, make it. But it's, I, I don't know, it's hard to say that he wouldn't get a, a decent amount of playing time on this team, especially with the lack of uh, front court experience and depth. So, yeah. That was also good. And uh, the last thing really was um, just Kevin Knox quietly, as you've put it before, where he can quietly put up these numbers. And he did that again. He So he finishes with 12 and 10. It was a rough shooting night for him. It was 6 of 19 from the field and 0 of 5 from 3. And he had five turnover, uh, turnovers to go with that as well. And yet he had a nice little 12 and 10 double-double, which getting those 10 boards for a uh, a – Small forward is a a nice little uh, bonus, so I, I liked I liked that. With Knox, you mentioned his shooting. He's two of thirteen from three in preseason, but we need to keep in mind too. And this is something I talked about leading up to the draft and through the pre-draft process. And when the Knicks drafted him, he wasn't exactly a great three-point shooter in college either. But it's something that when you watch him and all of his mannerisms and everything about his shot leads you to believe that he'll end up being a good shooter there. And I like to see that he's taken 13 threes in, in three games. Yeah, I like to see him get those opportunities from beyond the arc. If he's taken three or four threes a game, sign me up for that. 
What do you think? No, definitely agree with that. And it looked, and I brought this up in our uh, chat before, but it looked like that's almost the intention of, of what they're trying to have him do in the preseason. You know, one thing I noticed was in the first half of this game, um, Knox, like, couldn't hit anything, couldn't hit, you know, throw a ball in the ocean. And then the second half, pretty much after the 11-minute mark, it looked like four of the first five possessions after that, uh, they just kept running the same set up on the uh, on, on the wing. They would have Knox kind of come off around the screen from Cantor. Cantor would kind of pitch the ball back to Knox, and then it would get Knox running downhill. And it was like, it was nice to see Fisdale kind of saying, you know what, you're not really shooting too well so we'll give you you know so, you know we'll put you in a spot where you can succeed a little bit better so it was just getting him off that little running start or if Cantor cleared uh, cleared up enough space he was able to just pull up and shoot and they just kind of kept force feeding him the ball into those decisions so that was for me nice to see it, it just looks like we don't have to worry about like last year where Frank was on a short leash with Hornacek and um, one thing we've always lamented with Hornacek and prior coaches was with Porzingis, he, they don't really put him in positions to succeed when he's not shooting well. They just kind of keep dumping it to him on, on the elbow and letting him jack up shots and go to work. So it was nice to see um, the focus be on getting a, a main cock on this team and, you know, in the long term going early and often. Like that's something to me that speaks to this being a nice little marriage with Knox and uh, Fisdale. I'm glad you brought up that play because you know who used to run that play all the time when he was Nick. Carmelo Anthony. Mm -hmm. That was the play the Knicks used to run for him all the time, and he'd have that one dribble pull up from the free throw line. They used to yep. do that all the time. And I think with Knox, one thing I've noticed in his game that I'd like to see him, maybe as he gets more experience in the NBA, maybe as he gets coached a little more, on those opportunities, he pulls up too much. He can take two or three more dribbles and get himself closer to the hoop because when he comes off those screens, a lot of times he has an angle and he resorts to the pull-up with the guy contesting from the back, which still counts as a contest. That's still in your peripheral vision. So with Knox, I'd love to see him take two or three more dribbles and get to the hoop more because that gets you to the free throw line. It gets you easier opportunities. I did like to see that little floater he had because he did that early in the game and it, he got a nice bounce off the rim and it went in off that play because – that was a huge part of his offensive game while in college was that floater. It's a weapon for him. He, he'll have it in his arsenal, and it's not something we've seen all that much early on. So I was glad to see that part of his game kind of come out and really start to become a staple. That's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see Knox have that floater in his back pocket so that he can work with that and NBA defenses can respect it. But you love what you see from Knox so far. The efficiency still I don't think is going to be great this year. I wouldn't be surprised if he shoots 40%, 39% even. It's it's definitely possible, but that shouldn't really be our main concern, in my honest opinion. Yeah, and uh, about that floater, too. He brought that out later in the game again. He did. Um, one of I think one of the shots late in the third, or maybe it was the end of the fourth, he had a couple of wild shots, and uh, he lost the ball coming around that exact same play, that exact same screen. He kind of fumbled it. And then he stuck with it, picked the ball back up, took two strides, and threw just like this really high banking shot off the glass, and it, and he got it to drop. And that's special. We've seen it a few times out this floater. Like that's a special kind of touch to have for a big man. So that's very encouraging and fun to have in his bag. It is. It is. His offense is going to come along, but it, it's going to be a process. And I'd like to see him start shooting the three with a little more efficiency, but. With him, you know, you're just looking for signs. That's all we say about these young guys. It's all about the signs and what they can show us. Another guy that has been an absolute monster in the preseason has been Ennis Cantor, who against New Orleans had 20 points, 15 boards, 5 assists. I thought he actually played really good man-to-man -man defense on Anthony Davis, held Davis to 15 points on 5 of 17 shooting. So Cantor, we know he's not a good defender. And we, we totally understand that, and no one would claim he is. But you like to see him getting his work in, and, I mean, he's going to put up these numbers. I think he might even end up with better numbers than he had last year when he set, what he, I think he had career high in, in points and rebounds. I mean, you're going to see everything come out for Cantor this year because he's going to get every opportunity. Yeah, they need, they need somebody to eat up a lot of that usage in a lot of those minutes. So, I mean, he's going to get – him and Timmy are going to get a lot of work early and often, and – 
Cantor just never misses around the post, so with increased opportunities, I think he's going to see a nice little spike this year. But it's still encouraging to see him get going like that. This is his back-to-back. I think uh, in the in the game against Brooklyn, he had a 20-20 if I'm 20, not mistaken. 20, yep. So, you know, 20-15 right on the back of a 20-20 is pretty damn good. And against the Pelicans, which is that's a pretty big team, especially Anthony Davis. So, um and the last thing for him with his defense, a lot of that got overblown last year because him and KP played pretty well together. That gets lost in uh, a lot of what ended up happening last year. But KP was able to shore up a lot of his defensive woes the same way that when uh, we saw him and Adams play together in OKC, they were really like a really good group to have out there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I don't know that it's totally overblown. His defensive, I'm not going to say he's a, you know, say he's a good defender or anything, but uh, to say he's as horrific as people think, like you said about squaring up body to body, I mean, as long as he's not getting hung out to dry a little bit too far, I, I think he's mostly all right. Not great, not good, barely solid, but just like, you know, all right. Well, he's strong as hell. That's his advantage. And it, it's tough when in the pick and roll, he's just not that mobile in terms of side to side. That's the issue. So when he has to go in the post and bang a little bit, he's a strong guy. He can hold the zone. And I just want to correct myself. Did not set a career high in points. Had 14.3 with OKC in 2016-17. 14.1 last year with the Knicks. I didn't want to be wrong. I didn't want to have people at me. I didn't want you to come after me, Kyle. I know you like proving me wrong. And even if I said it wrong I on the pod, you'd, you'd come back for that. You would. And you know it. I it's it's one of my great joys in life to be quite <laughs> honest with you. Now nothing makes me happier than knowing that I've made you burn. It's probably the strongest thing we have in in our uh, in our colleague ship here. You just pointing shit out that I said wrong. Although last night, who's the biggest Gary Sanchez fan? I felt completely redeemed last night for all of my defending of Sanchez the entire year. Me too, to be honest with you, because I had to get quiet for a while. Yeah. So, so it felt re- <laughs> it's, it felt really good to uh, triumphantly emerge from the shadows like that. So, um, Jesus Christ, those were two moon shots, man. Absolute I mean, bombs. Just it, it, it felt good because it's been a while, like where he's where he's hit the ball so hard that he he's got him and Judge of like these special home runs are like when when they hit a home run like you generally know like it's it's gone there's no like ones that barely get over like if they ran into one it's gone and i haven't felt the way for Gary in a few months now and to see him just get back up there the first one you know i, I questioned it i kind of knew it was going out but i was like ah maybe not i don't know he hasn't been hitting that well <laughs> and then, but but it got out pretty significantly oh, and then and then uh and then the second one was the, just uh, another did you see the um the metrics yeah for where the balls were hit yeah compared to where Fenway was and they were almost off of the map yes it was absurd it was absurd and it was funny because when Judge hit the home run in the first inning it was like wow that was an absolute bomb and then Sanchez hit it to the same spot but up and (laughs) over the (laughs) sign (laughs) yeah so that that sound by the way is all the Mets fans tuning out they just deleted the pod and they're not listening anymore sorry fellas you know, that's how we had to do We had to eradicate them somehow. So. <laughs> Sorry to all our fellas and ladies out there that are Mets fans. But let's talk back. One thing I want to bring up with the Knicks is the pace of play that they've shown in the preseason. So they're third in the league in pace over these three games, which that's something that they have not really done over the last few years is play with pace, play fast, work in transition. And we've mentioned this before when we've watched the games, but – it's clear that Fizdale is saying, whoever gets, if you're a wing, if you're a guard, if you get that rebound, push that ball up the court. Do whatever you can. Let's get in our offense, and let's try to make an impact as soon as possible on this game. And I'm curious if that sticks. I don't think they'll finish as high as third, but they could finish right in the middle of the pack and pace, and that'll be good to see because they have young guys that can run. We talked about Cantor, too. That guy hustles up and down the floor. He runs yeah, he, he runs the floor. He sometimes is very lazy on defense but that's a totally different thing but when he if he's not the one to secure the rebound which most most of the time he is he gallops down the floor like it's it's obvious and you see Trey Burke is another guy Fizdale has to love his stamina because that guy just runs and runs and runs and runs so that's something we got to watch during the first you know I I want to wait a certain amount of time I don't think we should be watching in the regular season if it's been five games and they're you know sixth in the league in pace we shouldn't put that much stock into it but if it's 15 20 games and we've seen this team play fast that's something we can look for and that's something that could become more of the identity as this roster takes form 
Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the pace thing because if you watch, it's never they're they're never waiting for somebody to go get the ball anymore. Everything that we've seen is, uh, if you got the rebound, go. You know, we've seen Trey Burke bring the ball up, Moutier bring the ball up, Frank Knox bring the ball up and be a playmaker on the break, and then we even saw in the last game Noah Vonleh pushing on the break, and then he hit Trey in the corner, Trey uh, Trey hit him back, I think, and then you know it's like they're just letting everyone push it's just look this is simple basketball push take a couple dribbles make a quick decision we'll have someone on the wing you know guys are leaking out a little bit and that's that's refreshing that's something that i thought we were going to see with hornacek who hit the whole basis for his success in phoenix was um you know utilizing his point guards playing to their strengths and letting them get out and run and then we have we saw none of that last year and that's why uh a lot of us were irked too but it's nice to see them just a very you know, open style of play. And it lines up with what Fisdale said too. I mean, he said that, you know, they were going to get out like this and just push and get out on the break. And it's nice to see him, uh, you know, the, the words matching what we see on the court for once. Yes. Because over the off season, nothing Fisdale said made us really have any pause. So it's good to see him installing a lot of those schemes that we've seen. So in terms of that pace, and you mentioned them, looking for guys to bring up the ball. The guy in a lot of offenses that brings up that ball is the point guard. For this Knicks team in the preseason, none of the point guards have really jumped off the page, if you will, because from Burke to Neely Keenan, neither of those guys has done a bunch on offense. Trey Burke is only playing like 17 minutes a game in the preseason, which I thought he'd be playing a little more, but that's not that important. Neely Keenan obviously had a, a better game against the Nets than he has in the other two. Struggled. Uh, on Friday night, had his shot blocked a couple times. So, and then there's Moutier, who's been just an utter mess on just every aspect of basketball for this team in the preseason. We saw Trier have a relatively quiet game on Friday night, but I'm wondering as the preseason goes on and as we approach the season, how these guard minutes are going to get doled out and how Fisdale is going to take what he saw in this preseason and utilize that once the basketball gets real. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just trying to look up uh, Moutier's numbers. They're not good. Uh, he's averaging 2.7 points in the preseason. Yeah, I mean, the may, maybe you don't feel this way. Uh, I'm just going to try to word this properly because I, I went off thinking about Moutier for a second. Go for it. And it looks like he's doing things that would make him be a good basketball player offensively. And then the results are just never there. Like it, when when he gets the ball, he's he's pushing right. Like he's getting up. He, he's doing what you're supposed to do. And then just almost every time he does anything with the basketball after that, like nothing happens. There's no results. He hits nothing. They don't turn to assists. Like just I, I don't know how else to describe it. Like it looks like. 50 like that initial action looks like all right like he's gonna do something he's got like the body for it it looks like he's trying clearly and then just nothing does that make sense no at all i do not feel that way but i understand what you mean because isn't that inherently the problem with moutier as a basketball player that you watch him and some of the things he does you're like wow that looks nice that's what would make a good basketball player but the product and the end result has never been a positive one because cause I was trying to, I mean, he put, he got up, you know, the floor offensively uh, against the Pelicans a, a handful of times, especially in the first quarter. And I'm watching him get out on the break. I'm like, yeah, like, this is how you, this is ideally how you start the break. He's, like, pushing up. He's pushing the pace. And then it just never, like, nothing comes to fruition. Like, that's, and then I started feeling that way about some of the other games I watched last season. It made me think of it. And I was like, it looks like, I'm not going to sit here and say he's giving, like, 110% effort or anything, but it's like, it does. It looks like he's making a, a smart decision initially to me. It looks like he's a basketball player doing a, a smart basketball thing, and then whatever happens after that, it just never falls the way you'd like it to. So, um, I, I I don't know, man. He's got to go. We we tried. What does it was, it, was, it was a good gamble, you know? But it's just a failed experiment at this point. What does Emmanuel Mudiay do well on the basketball court? What does he even do that you would say he's av- I, he's average at that? Honestly, maybe I'm not gonna say you're gonna say ball handling, but like the only thing that I, I I keep going back to is just like him trying to push the ball 
in transition. But like, and I don't mean like he's successful at completing the act of pushing the ball in transition, but like the initial burst is what I'm thinking about. He's just not, but but that's not good. You know, that's not a skill yeah. to take an initial burst. It's like, I, I always see him like he gets the ball, he turns and it's like, all right, here we go. Like we got something cooking and then nothing happens. It's just, it's just not good, man. He just looks like a basketball player and he's just simply not one. It's just not. And he, he's, he falls down. He's always on the ground. He had a couple plays against New Orleans where they, he telegraphed his passes poorly and they picked him off. He had the one play in the post where he tried to post up for like six seconds and fumbled it. He's done nothing, nothing to install any confidence in his game from this coaching staff and from this team. So I don't well, know where you go from here with him because you wonder maybe if he's just a bench warmer guy, that's fine. But he shouldn't be playing 20 minutes on this basketball team this year. It's just a fact. And that's what he was playing last year at the end of the year when the Knicks made the deal for him, which I still think was a perfectly fine gamble to make. And we've said that all along, that that was a deal that we had no issue with because McDermott's a fine player, but he's not someone that was in the long-term plans for the Knicks. And they gave up a late second-round pick. That It's essentially a very small price to pay for a guy that's going to just be a stopgap. And if he ever was good, which was always a very slim possibility, then, hey, you know, that, that's all right. But at with this team, I just don't know what you do with him at this point. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring him up because I wanted your thoughts on Fizdale has uh, used a lot of nice buzz, buzzwordy kind of phrases this summer, which is good because I've ate it all up. I've enjoyed it. But one of those things that went around pretty quickly was, oh, you keep what you kill. You keep what you kill. All the starting spots are open. Like anybody can get it kind of thing. So would it would not would this not be the perfect time to really. I guess, draw the line in the sand. You know, not necessarily, you know, he got beat out for a starting spot or something, but just a roster spot potentially. You know, a lot of people have been wondering, myself included, about, well, what happens with Trier? If Trier plays five games that are pretty damn impressive and Moutier plays five games that are just brutal, and we already know he's sort of on his last stand here as your uh, gift the other night so perfectly put it so i mean what do you do you think fizdale would make uh, maybe not the right words but an example out of him and try to cut him and uh work a way to get trier onto the nba level or what do you think happens here i don't think there's a chance that moody is not on the roster on opening night i don't think that's an option that we should consider i just think it would be an enormous upset with what they've said and how much he's played honestly in the preseason you're more likely to see if they're going to talk about guaranteed guys. You got to think about who hasn't been playing. Like, what if they love what Von Lee's bringing, and like, what is Luke Cornett doing for them anymore? You know what I mean? And as much mm-hmm. as I, I like Luke Cornett, I made that clear last episode. It's they're going to have to make some decisions here, but I don't think Moody is in danger of not being on this team. I think he's in danger of potentially losing minutes and a minute share if he doesn't play better. But I, you'd have to look this up because I'm sure you can figure this out, but how often is a guy that's averaging 20 minutes in the preseason end up not making the NBA roster? I just don't think that that's something that's even within the realm of possibility, even though perhaps it should be. So then better question. When do you think his, uh, his leash is going to run out with Fisdale this season? Do you think it's going to be first quarter of the season after the all-star break like when 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 do we finally think that Fisdale goes you know what like I I fucking tried man it's just not happening anymore relegated to the bench and then you know we'll see what happens after that maybe an increased role for Dotson at that point but what what do you think happens I mean maybe December I think in Fisdale's mind and you need to we need to remember these things sometimes people that are within an organization always view their players through rose-colored glasses they always want to say, he's young. He was in the league. He hasn't been in a great situation. This can still work out because you're always going to want that guy that you have on your team to play well. It's natural. And sometimes it's to the detriment of teams and they can end up attached to a guy for too long or you know, put their proverbial wagon on a guy that never was that good in the first place. But with the Knicks just being a team that, despite their 3-0 and immaculate record in the post in the preseason excuse me they're gonna be bad so I don't see why Moutier would lose a ton of opportunity unless he is 
this bad on a long term. Like if he plays this poorly through October and November and he is just an absolute mess on the basketball court, then maybe at that point he's a guy that loses minutes. But I think they're going to give him still a couple months opportunity to see what he can do. And I mean, I'm over it. I don't really want to see him anymore on my television screen because we know what he is at this point and he's not helping anyone else that he's playing with. At least with the other young guards, you can see that they have an impact on some players. Like Frank Nilakina makes defense better. Trey Burke can heat up in an instant. Moutier isn't making anyone else better on this team and he's actively bringing down the players around him. So while I do think that he shouldn't be playing, I, I, there's going to be an opportunity there for him that's going to remain for the foreseeable future. And that that's my guess. That's my opinion. I don't know if that's true. Based on what they've said, based on what we know about how teams view their younger players, that's what I would guess happens. Okay. That's perfectly fair. What do you think? I mean, for me, I kind of felt the same way. Do you think that he'll a, get plenty of opportunities? Like from No, I think, I think especially the first month or two he's going to get plenty of opportunities. But I, I worry about how much his actual role would dwindle I guess because I don't from everything that we've seen in the preseason it just doesn't look like there's a ton there to support the argument for the coaching staff being in favor of Frank playing any kind of ball handler or lead guard in this offense like I I think we were sort of having to embrace that he's going to be some sort of a ball handling wing you know that that sort of might be his ceiling as far as like ball handling duties right. but it doesn't look like they're ever gonna they, they don't have an interest to put him really on ball and, and let him roll the ball out so they i mean it's going to be burke to start the year it looks like a point and then they still need that second ball handler so i don't know that they're really gonna dramatically reduce his role you know maybe they'll cut into his minutes and let frank get a little bit more run but i, I don't know that it's going to be anything as dramatic as we'd like, I guess is my point. Like in a perfect world, it kind of happens like you said. And, and and after December, it just isn't there. And then they really relegate him to the bench, and he gets very minimal minutes. But this team already isn't that good, and I just think there's kind of a lack of ball handling. And I just feel like because of that, they're just going to give him most of the year to try to figure it out. Would you rather have Ron Baker or Emmanuel Mudiay? Ooh man, I I am a noted. Uh, Baker Basher, so this is you tough, are. but that's why I asked. Yeah, yep, I admitted it on Twitter, so I'm not gonna deviate. I would, I would absolutely rather have Ron Baker on this team, and that says it all. Be- because I mean, Jesus, I the, from the playmaking standpoint, I, I know Moody is more of like the pure point guard, but like we've seen some good things from Baker, at least in moving the ball. I wouldn't say he's really an assist man, but uh, even if they're hockey assists, like he's a selfless guy in that uh, aspect of it. And then defensively, he's actually a plus guy to have there. You know, I- I've long said I don't think he could maintain that for bigger minutes, but in his little spot minutes that he plays, he's always been stout. So I, I don't – you can't really choose Moutier. There's nothing – there's nothing – no reason you choose Moutier unless you are still in love with his potential. Like, that's where we've gotten to. I get he's still young, and again, he can always figure it out. Guys develop – at weird times in their career, sometimes guys take a long time to figure it out. Maybe that's it for him. But um, there's no, there's nothing that we can do anymore to say he would really deserve it over Ron Baker, other than where he was drafted, that draft bias of being a lottery pick. He just doesn't, there's nothing that he provides. There's just, there's just nothing. So yeah, I would rather have Ron Baker, um, that, that at least he gives you something. What about you? Oh, I agree. Because what you said, at least Baker plays within the team, and he does not do a lot well at all. Like He's a guy, what we said about Moutier, what does he do well? Ron Baker doesn't do anything that well either, but he, he hustles. You know, we, we saw the couple plays that he had where he's diving on the ground, which I know it's, it's a funny cliche because it's Ron Baker, but Fizdale likes that stuff. And at least he plays within on offense. He moves the ball around. Moutier is just, I just don't know what he's doing for this team. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what – they decide to do with him because that draft pedigree, like you said, is all that they're holding on to at this point. And you know what? Bad players get drafted in the top 10 all the time. It happens all the time. And it takes a long time for teams to admit their mistakes. Look how long with Denver, they waited a couple of years and determined that he just wasn't that good. And then they benched him and then finally shipped him out when he wasn't playing that much. 
So it's you see it all the time. And with him, you wonder you wonder where his NBA future goes because I I don't think it's on the Knicks. And you wonder how long he's going to be around. But let's go from one Emmanuel Moutier to a couple vets that played well on Friday night, and that's two wings in Lance Thomas and Tim Hardaway. So, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, Matthew. So, are you telling me that Lance Thomas played well? I am. That's hold what on, I'm telling hold you. On. Are Are you also, in fact, telling me? That this wasn't just maybe a mere defensive effort? He had one, three, 13 points. Oof. I mean, that's a... W- would you say that that's a pretty significant contribution for a player that a lot of a lot of fans here consider him, you know, garbage? I certainly would. So for a garbage, or a garbage player, this is certainly a good performance. I certainly would. Inter- interesting. I'm just going to add that it to my notes. It makes you think. Yeah, but put it on the notes. Lance Thomas, good game. I think he's got a stranglehold on a starting spot. I don't think there's any chance he is not in this starting lineup. Yeah, I mean, this is something you guys, topic-wise, talked about uh, a couple of pods ago. Uh, one of the ones I wasn't on, I think that was the one Reed was on, where the Mitchell Robinson versus Cantor starting debate had popped up in our mentions, and we had to tend to that and kind of throw the wet blanket in everybody. Um, the same thing has kind of applied to Lance Thomas starting at the four. Everybody just like, well, why would you sign Mario Hazonia if he wasn't going to start at the four? Why would you draft Kevin Knox if he wasn't going to start or play at the four? And it's like, guys, uh, as much as we would like for those things to happen from an entertainment and fun perspective, they aren't going to start all of the rawest players at once. It's not going to happen. We're not going to have a starting lineup of Reclamation Project Trey Burke, which we still don't even know what's going to happen with him this season. So... You know, him at the one. We already know what you're going to get with Timmy at the two. And then you have, are, are we really suggesting we start Knox, Hazonia, and Mitchell Robinson at the three, four, five? It's preposterous. Yeah, it was, it's never a decision based it, on it, it was never. It, it was never a thing that was going to no. happen. Like, and I get and I get it. Like, if you're playing in 2K, like, that would be what you would do, probably. It's probably what we would all do. But, you know, that's, that's different. You can control that a little bit differently if you're good at the game. Like, it's not... That's not what's going to happen in real life. In real life, Mitchell Robinson is going to pick up four fouls in 15 minutes. Like, I mean, we have to be realistic. And we really are high on this draft class and on these young guys. You know, we like Mario, too. He's a fun player. We think he can play well with Fizdale. We've said that. But, I mean, come on, guys. I mean, there's always going to be a vet in lineups like this to kind of hold the fort down. Like, they would not put out a lineup with just all young guys, and especially not just young guys, but guys who aren't really defenders. They just never, ever would do that. So, yes, Lance Thomas is going to play, and he's going to play at the four. And he's not going to be asked to do a whole lot. So I don't know why that's always an issue, too. He's just going to sit there, take a couple of threes, play some defense on the toughest assignment, and allow the young guys to kind of go out and do their things. That's it. And he's absolutely going to start until, I I don't know. I I don't know if Fizda would even experiment this year. I just think he's, I couldn't agree more. He's got a stranglehold on that goddamn job. And that's not a mistake. Like, it, There's nothing wrong with having a guy like Lance Thomas to start in this lineup. He's also shown more <laughs> off the chop or off the off the chop, off the bounce chops. Like he's had some yeah. nice little drives to the hoop, some lay ins, because that's always the problem with him, right? When you're on offense, he was a guy that could kind of space the floor, but he doesn't take many threes. And he's shot them at a, a great clip for the past few years now. But he wasn't offering you a ton in terms of others, not a big cutter, you know, so it's nice to see him do those other things and kind of operate in the offense and just be asked to just a a sliver more. It's not like you're asking him to do that much. And on the other end, we know what he brings. He's bringing intensity. He had a nice play on Davis. He had some nice plays against the Nets. You know, you know what you're getting from this guy on the defensive end. And that's why Fisdale's locked him in from day one. You need guys to lead by example, like, that's always the thing on these young teams is you always want to have the vets out 100%. there. But then, but then, I think people equate that to the older on the on the way out kind of guys. Like oh, like a Jared Dudley who's gonna play ten minutes a game and laugh on the bench. Oh, like a Channing Fry kind of guy. Like sometimes your vet needs to actually play. You know, like Lance is still a guy sort of in his primish years. Like we know what he is. He's a stout defender. He's been. And we we went over this. We raged over this in our Slack chat about how his numbers don't show up. But when you play on bad teams all the time, it's very hard for your numbers to show anything meaningful when you guys are getting gashed every night. 
So we know that if you if you look and you watch the games, he's a good stout defender, and guys need to play with smart guys on the court. Like that's how you learn how to play at this level. So Knox, as a guy who's going to play, you know, some three this year, and hopefully more four beyond that, you're going to want to learn some things from a guy who plays that position, plays it or can play it pretty well within his role. And another thing all young guys need to work on when coming into the league is the right defensive habits. And, you know, for him to play alongside uh, Lance at a position he'll eventually play anyway and learn some of those habits from Lance is another good thing. So you, you need to play with smart players. Uh, at the end of the day, you, there, there's reasons why bad teams play bad, and it's when you, you're playing too many of these awful you know, selfish players together. But Lance is a guy who's very unselfish and just kind of wants to care for these young guys. And a couple of the interviews and things um, that he said so far, it's all about the young guys and being able to teach them. So I, I, I've been a staunch defender of Lance as have, um, you know, a couple of us here. And I just think everybody's got to cut him some slack. He's never going to come in and give you a double double, but come on guys. I'm a big numbers guy and I get admonished for that sometimes. No, no, I, I know, I know. It's surprising. No. I, I wonder who does most of that bashing. No idea. No, no idea. I would love to meet that guy. <laughs> Sounds like a real swell human being. Fantastic. With this Knicks team, I'm always going to look at the numbers, and they should always be trying to make the best team possible. But when you have young guys like this and you know you're going to be bad, sometimes the narratives matter. Sometimes having a veteran guy out there like Lance Thomas that cares for these guys matters for the long term. Sometimes maybe he's not the best fit because he's not a good rebounder at the four. And sure, they'll have some other lineups in there where he's not in that scenario and they have someone else playing the four and maybe it's a better fit. But I think those things still matter. And having a guy like Lance Thomas, like you said, lead by example. This is how you play defense in the NBA. This is what it means to to slog through a season when you know you're really not going to do anything special. And that's a hard thing to do, especially for young guys. They want to be winning. They want to be doing everything they can to make the playoffs, to make some noise. So with a presence like Lance in this offense and in this team, all he has to do is shoot that three around where he's been, maybe tick those attempts up if he's going to play more minutes, if he's going to start on this team, and just do what he's done for the past three or four years in New York, which is be a quiet, steady presence for a Knicks team in need of a, a quiet, steady guy with all the turmoil surrounding them. That's what we're looking at for him. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So Tim Hardaway Jr., another veteran that's going to be in the starting lineup, had a great game on Friday, 21-5-5. Five and five. Not great in terms of efficiency, but he got off to a hot start and then started doing Tim Hardaway Jr. things, which I don't even need to go into detail because everyone listening knows exactly what that means. Chucking up shots, not in the best opportunity to be able to just get in the offense. So he's still frustrating, and I'm, I'm always a defender of Timmy. I just want to see him get rid of those, those shots where he doesn't need to be in a position to take them. Just wait for the offense around you to do its thing. You're a good three-point shooter. When it comes to volume, you're going to get plenty of shots there. We know the efficiency can come up. I'm a firm believer that that's going to happen this year. Give yourself the opportunity to slow down, play within the offense, and do your thing. And uh, that's not going to happen because that's not who he is and it's not how he's wired. And frankly, I don't think that's what this team is asking of him. I think that they've made it clear they want him to take a lot of shots and be the guy that's going to score the most on this offense, and that's what he should be because it's going to be either him or Cantor as their leading scorer unless Knox really surprises us. So with Timmy, I don't know what more there is for us to say about his game at this point because it is what it is, but he still is an important part of this team for this season and is going to eat up a chunk of possessions. i just like to see him fine-tune those a little bit more. It's mostly just forcing shots. If he just cleans up the uh, the shot selection, I feel like I feel like that would make all the difference. To be quite honest with you, because that's what ended up happening uh, on Friday a little bit. He had a couple of tough shots, but I mean, I think he was three of five from deep. Right. So, I mean, he was hitting those at a good clip. Yeah, he he but was then, three of eight I mean, from three on Friday. Oh, three yeah, of eight. No, sorry. That's right. So, but um, 
I just feel like once he gets inside the paint, I mean, inside the three point line, I mean, that's when things go terribly wrong. I, I, I feel don't... the exact same way because he, he's chucking up I... those gross mid range jumpers when he doesn't need to. And a lot of times too, they're, they're they're not the cleanest looks. Like if they were like the, a lot of those ones that Trey Burke ended up Correct. getting end of last season, I wouldn't have really minded because that's why we didn't really shit on Trey Burke because we we're just like, well, I mean, he's taking wide open shots for the most part. He's just taking what the defense gives him and he's just hitting them at an impossible clip. So you know, it, it was what it was. But Timmy's kind of getting in and taking these very not clean looks, these contested looks or um, ill timed looks, and it's bringing his efficiency down like just like you're saying waiting for the offense a little bit would just do uh, just a ton for him and i'm not saying like shoot seven less shots a game but i mean just pick one to shoot those seven shots instead i mean they're not always going to be pretty it's basketball anybody's played knows this it's not always going to be you get you know seven clean beautiful open threes every you know game sometimes you got to force things or take something that's a little bit contested but just the rate of which he does it is is far too often so you know other nice things about it is he's kind of continuing that playmaking role from last season that kind of got overlooked um wasn't anything wild but we knew that he had those chops last year and was making a lot better reads than he had in years prior so you know that was good rebounds were you know getting five for a uh at the shooting guard position is pretty good so I, i liked most of what i saw um, he started out really slow in the first couple games, so I wonder if, uh, you know, that's why he was shooting it a little bit more on Friday night, really trying to shake off the rest of that rust. But overall, I thought it was a fine game from Timmy. I just think, I said it with Horn a second, obviously he was never going to play this role, but Fisdale's the kind of coach that can look at Tim Hardaway and say, listen, you can be a good player in this league. Right now, you're fine. You do your thing. You score 17 points for us. You can be much better than you are if you tighten up this shot selection. And you got to put your faith in me as the coach to put you in positions to succeed because that's what I'm going to do for you. It's these shots where he gets off a screen and he's off balance and he shoots the mid-range jumper. This is a guy that shouldn't he's be always operating. He's off balance. Yes, exactly. This is a guy that shouldn't be operating in the mid-range that much. He can drive to the hoop. He can finish. And he's shooting seven threes a game. He shouldn't be taking these mid-range shots when he's coming off screen and stuff. It's just not the best place for him to be. And the Knicks still aren't shooting enough threes, I think, because if you look, and it's only three games, obviously, so it's something we'll have to take stock of once the season begins. But they're basically taking the same amount of threes per game as they did last year. I think maybe one or two more. So I'd like to see them still shoot more threes. And a lot of the onus on that is from Hardaway. He's shooting eight threes in Friday's game. That's exactly what he should be shooting. He should be out there beyond the arc, being the guy on this team that can help them out in that facet of the game. Yeah, I mean, I still don't, they still don't have enough shooting on this team, though. I mean, just from the roster well, maker, right, there's not really... Courtney Lee hasn't played. That's something important to consider because uh, although he doesn't take enough threes, he's another guy that's a threat from beyond the arc. And that's And that's fair and true. It's just... I don't see any of the guards, and that's where a lot of those three should be coming from, and I don't think they're, as a collective unit, those guys that are going to get almost all the minutes at point, you know, I, I don't see them shooting the requisite amount that we'd like Agreed. to see. And I feel like that really sets the tempo. Like, Trey Burke is going to start shooting. Maybe he will. He did kind of hint at it in um, at media day that he was going to work on it. You know, he was working on pulling it, uh, the range out a little bit more. So... I mean, it remains to be he's seen. He's taken four course, threes in three games, Trey Burke. You know what yeah. I mean? So exactly. that's, that's, that's not that's what, not what you want. So that's, that hasn't he, happened so far. You, you'd want to see at least like three good looks from your point yeah. guard. Like that that would be, I think, a nice, easy low bar to clear. And, you know, we're not getting that. Frank isn't aggressive enough to shoot that many right. from what we can tell unless things change. Despite us, I know you have full faith in his shooting form and him being a good three-point shooter. Yes. But, um... You know, and obviously Moody isn't going to... Oh, my God. He's not Watching him three, shoot so is I, painful. The threes. is hitch and hit. Oh. What was it last he's year? Didn't, one of the worst Didn't hitches. he miss, like, his first 18 threes last year with the Knicks or something crazy like that? Yeah, it, it, was, it was right around oh 20, my God. and then he ended up hitting one, yeah. It's brutal. So, so yeah, I mean, those guys aren't going to shoot threes. So, pretty much, it's you, you're putting... All the, all the three-point shooting is going to be from your wing grouping. It's all going to come from Timmy... Courtney Lee, Knox is going to get a lot of looks this year. And, um, you know, Lance is kind of your your four now, but he's going to play minutes at the three as well. And he's going to shoot a couple a game. 
but it's still not it's still not enough it, you know we don't have like one guy that we can go to with enough efficiency to really dump him it's not like we have like a chris middleton type guy where we can just be like look man just keep fucking shooting right we'll get you your looks like we, we don't have a guy that we can trust efficiently yet it's a bunch of you know guys that either shoot efficiently uh efficiently but at a low um usage there like lance is going to take one or two a game courtney's going to take one or two a game but they shoot at roughly 40 percent like we would want them shooting more and they just simply don't 100%. so the makeup of this team isn't going to be there again I, I hope they just start shooting more even if they have to force it just shoot some threes get them up there but i don't think that they're going to do so with any kind of confidence or any significance this year unfortunately yeah i i agree it, it, they're gonna have to get some more shooting maybe that's a guy like trier if he plays more could give you because he was shooting you know five threes a game last year in college and shooting it at a pretty good 38 percent clip so maybe you get some from there i mean i mean and, and the other thing too is we always forget about dotson but dotson needs to crack this rotation right. He's going to shoot, and we know he could hit the three, but we haven't seen him enough. So hopefully hopefully something happens and he finally breaks through because <clears throat> I was thinking about it too. The the Frank and Trier lineups that we've seen together are pretty fun. It's basically uh, Trier getting to do what he wants on offense, which is fine, playing alongside Frank, and then Frank kind of shores up the defense. And I feel like it, if you play those two guys together and you know a Knox and a Lance and – I feel like that would be a sneaky good three-point shooting lineup, you know, because I feel like Frank would get open looks there. Maybe that improves um, both his efficiency and his volume. But you know, Trier is going to shoot from all over, so hopefully he's going to hit some from deep. Knox is going to uh, another guy that we expect to shoot a uh, three or four a game, and um, you know, Lance will get a couple of looks up too. I feel like that would be some a lineup resembling that might be your best chance of it because if it's like a Burke, Timmy, Courtney kind of thing is just gonna i don't see it happening you love alonzo trier I, i'm all in man i remember when we had the podcast right after the Knicks. i picked him up and i said i haven't seen anything so i'm gonna spend a few hours researching and i asked you for a bunch of articles mm-hmm. and you sent me yep. them and then i went on youtube and was watching a couple of uh d- different game highlights and i mean the kids the kid's a fucking gamer and he's just got a big bag of tools to use with with these moves and i don't want to go too nuts because it's been three preseason games that we've seen from him two that were really good one uh, on friday where he finished with seven points uh didn't shoot all that well but he's got all the confidence that you'd want i mean the offensive tools are there i mean he looks pretty explosive when he's out there too so i mean i clearly and obviously just like everybody else need to see more i'm not going to declare it a win but i am extremely encouraged with what i've seen so far he's clearly like when you when you watch the games and now this isn't summer league anymore, so we can't say like uh, the low bar that we set for Kevin Knox was just like, well, he looks like he doesn't belong here. He looks like he's too yep. good. Like, tr- but but Trier looks like he belongs on an NBA court, and, and not just against you know bums. He's getting some good burn against actual NBA defenders too. So uh, it's hard not to start really drinking some of the Kool Aid with him. Uh, it stinks that we're only going to get him. What's the max he can come up? Forty five games on the two way. Yeah. Deal? Well, it's 45 days with the team, so it's not games, so it's days. days he spends with the Knicks. But there's been some talk that they might give him a roster spot, and that might come at the expense of someone else. Do you think that they should do that, or do you think they should just wait, give him his 45 days? Because at the end of that 45 days, if they decide they want to have him up with the Knicks, they can sign him and change the roster up a bit at that point. But they don't have to bring him aboard right away. I mean, to be quite honest with you, knowing th- for me there's two guys that are right off the bat from the main roster or what we expect to be the main roster that I, I feel are expendable. First one's Moutier. We cover that at length. And second for me is Baker because despite the couple of nice things he does in limited minutes, I don't think that's enough to keep him. But I, I would get rid of both those guys if it meant we could have Trier. So for me, there's not like a log jam or l- like a Trey Burke. Like, I don't know. Trey Burke had a nice, strong finish to last season. Maybe we got to keep him and see what else is there. Like, it's, it's Moutier. We know what we got last year. We know what we've seen so far in preseason. It's more of the same so far. I mean, I, it seems hasty to maybe pull the trigger on the Moutier thing, as we discussed earlier in the pod. But if you're asking me if I would do it, I would. I'd probably said Moutier pack in immediately and just bring Trey up and figure it out later. No matter what they decide to do, 
he'll get a chance to to prove that he's an NBA player. I mean, he's played essentially the fourth most minutes of anyone on the team because Knox is led with 83, Cantor 67, but then you get in the next group, it's Trier and Tim Hardaway have both played 62 total minutes, and so is Hazonia. He's been getting lots of burn, and I'm glad you said against NBA competition because it's not like he's been lighting it up at the end of games when he's playing just a bunch of scrubs that are on the end of the roster. He's played serious minutes against NBA guys. So we have reason to believe that he can do some of these things on an inconsistent basis as a rookie, but it's still exciting. And we said before too, the kid's got all the confidence in the world in himself. And that's what you want to see from a young guy. It can sometimes really come back to bite you, especially with the type of scorer he is. But I'd rather that than have him be tepid and and be apprehensive about scoring and feel like he can't really, he doesn't have the leash to do these things. And that's a credit to the coaching staff that they've said, hey, we understand what your game is. We know why we brought you here. You be you. Go do your thing. So I guess one, one question I have for you about Trier is then, well, twofold, really. Do you see this, do you see him getting more burned this year than Dotson got last year would be the first and then the second would be? I know we keep saying about, well, Moutier should be the easy man out, you know, based on what we've seen, right? But is there a world where maybe Trier being this impressive this early makes Dotson seem expendable? Yes. I don't know if that should be the case, but we've seen Dotson has not played much in the preseason. And he he struggled in uh, the Summer League, too. And we were... I wouldn't say any of us were worried, but then we figured in the preseason he'd play and figure it out, and we really haven't seen that now. And it's important to consider, this is not the regime that drafted Damian Dotson, right? Because that was when Phil Jackson was still at the helm. Steve Mills has been there, but Scott Perry was not. He's not necessarily their guy. So if they're not crazy about what they've seen from Dotson, and they don't think that he can be a rotation player, then they don't have any reason to stick with him because he's not a guy they drafted something to consider when you're, when you're talking about Dotson. But I think that when you're talking about oh, Trier and, and Moutier and the minutes that are going to go as the year goes on, I would think that you'll get more Trier minutes as the Knicks lose games and the losses start to pile up. And it, the, the starry eyed realization of a new season gives way to utter defeat as the Knicks start to, to move down the standings inevitably. That's when you'll probably see more Trier minutes, and that's when you're going to see him be up with the team. Maybe they'll get him on a, on a deal, but I don't think that, much like I said about the minutes Moutier's playing, you normally don't see a guy playing this much in the preseason just go by the wayside. But the Knicks also have faith in their Westchester team, so maybe they give him time there to go do his thing. It's going to be fun to follow, but he's a guy that clearly has a place on this team this year, and it, it might be later rather than sooner, but his, his chance is going to come. I hope so, man. He's a lot of fun to watch. Yes. I want to watch. I want to see how he does these last couple of games, just so um, we know if it wasn't uh, an outlier, so to speak, in those first couple of games. If he was just way too hot, but very, very intriguing so far. Hopefully, the next couple of games we get some answers. Yeah. Last thing, unless you have any other notes, the Knicks are fifth in defensive rating through the early stages of this NBA preseason. Small sample size, but that's a positive thing to see from a team that hasn't had a good defense in seven years, six years. So that's it's a positive sign, and maybe it's something that they won't be certainly won't be good at. But if you can see some improvements from last year's team, it's an added bonus. I'm gonna go on record and say it's full of shit. I don't believe <laughs> that's I, the I right just, opinion I just to have. Don't. Not because I saw I saw a stat earlier and I'm trying to find it. Um, I think I think the Cleveland Cavaliers' defensive rating after two preseason games is 96.9. I saw somebody tweet this earlier today, yeah. and then and then they try to reference it to that would have been tops in the league last year. It's a small sample size, but it's evident that the Cavs play with more energy and focus on the defensive end. And I feel like had I just put the word Knicks in that tweet instead of Cavs. It would have seen. I mean, you would have to seem out of your mind to tweet that, correct? You know, or just to correct. say that. So that's what, so that's why when you mentioned like the Knicks defensive rating, like yes, it, it's simply better than the alternative. Like if their D rating was like 112, 
we'd be, you know, lambasting them for it. So I'm not going to sit here and say like it, it's preposterously meaningless. Like it's, but but you simply cannot believe in this. This is obviously skewed because of the level of competition that these guys are playing. You know, Anthony Davis wasn't playing 42 minutes on Friday right. night and giving you a hundred percent ball. Like, you know what you're getting with the preseason. Like if you look into these numbers with any sort of confidence, you need to seek help and as much <laughs> as I'd like to believe that David Fisdale, like in his newfound culture and everything like that would be fun. But that's for us to figure out in the regular season right. when the games matter and guys are engaged and you're playing, you know, your best guys against another team's best guys. And you can kind of go to war there, but um, these these preseason defensive numbers just mean nothing, just absolutely nothing. At least the offensive numbers, I feel like you could make a little more right. sense. Because the pace number that we've talked about with the Knicks is reliant on their team scheme and strategy. Defensive Correct. numbers, there's always a lot of noise involved. Yeah, so I mean, it's just amplified to an impossible degree in the preseason. It's, I mean, you just simply cannot. You just you can't. He can't. I, I, and I saw a couple of people on Nick's Twitter talking about it, but I mean, just God, relax. Talk about the pace. Focus on the pace. That's correct. Just leave the defense alone. They have too many guys on the team that just simply aren't good defenders that are going to be playing. And when Cantor is your big man defender and he's playing 25, 30 minutes a night, you're, you're always going to be in a tough spot. And I think that one final note about rotation, Fisdale made a comment that he said he doesn't really see many guys playing over 28 minutes. So we've seen that in the preseason. The minutes have been spread out. I think Tim Hardaway Jr. will lead the team in minutes, and honestly, Kevin Knox might too. But I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of guys playing 38 minutes right off the bat. You know, I, I just don't think that's the case. So I think we're going to get a chance to see all this Knicks roster has to offer as the season goes on. I mean, that would be ideal, obviously. I want to just early in the year see a couple of guys get fair shakes. I don't know how much time Trier is going to get up here, but I'd like to see Dotson actually play meaningful minutes in the early going. Um, you know, I don't know what they're going to do with Robinson, but I'd hope we see him get some early chances too. So. Yeah, he's questionable for uh, tomorrow's game, by the way, after his ankle injury. So we might we might I, see I him like, or we might not tomorrow. I feel like they're not going to play him again and then play him in the finale. But um, I don't know, I, just a lot of intriguing young guys on this team, and that's just – when you have no expectations, it's, it's fun. No doubt. All right, so Knicks are back in action Monday night tomorrow against the Wizards. If Mitch Robinson doesn't play, we won't get another Robinson-Morris showdown, so that's a bummer, but they probably hold him out. Just let him get healthy. So, Kyle, any other notes before we get out of here? Kyle? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. So, um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I went into my whole... Uh, my whole pitch mode on you mute, do it so again. good. Yeah, so, uh, no, I was going to say, just make sure you guys check out the CKW shop. Uh, we have a new shirt up there, the Mitchell Labinson shirt, so it's got his number on the back. So, I mean, that's a nice, clean uh, piece of merch you guys could pick up now for the season. And before he gets insanely popular, you could uh, do the cool hipster thing where you like the thing that everybody uh, else didn't like first and then get angry when they finally do like it. So if you want to be that person, buy the shirt. Second, um, you know, make sure you rate us on iTunes or wherever else you can. Give us five stars and leave something nice because uh, that helps us continue to do this. So anything that you could do to give us some feedback or, or a nice review, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, the last thing, too, is to make sure you follow us on Instagram. So we are a little bit newer to it. Um, we did it over the summer. We made a new account. So you can follow us at the Knicks Wall on Instagram, um, as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. So if you could do those things, that'd be great. And uh, as far as the YouTube channel goes, we have our Ty Jordan, who was on the pod last week, who has some big things in the works for us there. So we're very excited about it. Um, but that's all I got. Yeah. Our Instagram is coming in hot because we got some great new graphics people. And that thing is going to be popping very soon yeah we got a lot of good new folks here and i'm uh, very happy about it's it it's gonna be great a lot, of, a lot of good people doing good work so we should be you know we should have a lot of, of uh, nice things for you guys absolutely too. about a week and a half until the season starts so for those of you i don't think i said this last episode but from here on out for the rest of the season you're going to get new stuff from us we're going to be recording sunday nights and wednesday nights so you're going to get new episodes every monday thursday to listen to we're going to always be cognizant of when the knicks are playing so you get the most topical content 
So be on the lookout. Monday, Thursday, that's when your new episodes are for us. But look forward to that. So we'll see how the Knicks do tomorrow. But we'll talk to you guys on Wednesday. 4-0. Baby. It's coming. Bye, guys. <laughs>